Hey everybody, nice to see you all. Uh, I was out here last year talking about uh, the culture of lock sport and uh, some of what had been going on up until that point. Uh, this talk today, in a lot of ways, is kind of a year in the life, one year recap of what's been going on. Um, but there have been a lot of exciting developments and I think we have uh, a lot of good things to talk about. So, name of the talk, How to Make Friends and Influence Lock Manufacturers. Uh, I'm Skylar Town. This is John King right here. Let's see if I can get Wrestling up. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is Skylar Town. My name is John King. You're going to hear a little bit more about me later. Um, I haven't slept in 48 hours. I'm a little intoxicated. <laughs> Out of curiosity, last night and this morning, who had a drunken conversation with me? Anybody? <laughs> Excellent. About 10 minutes ago. <laughs> um, all right, so how to make friends and influence lock manufacturers. The lock and key. Uh, the distinguished device of civilization and enlightenment. Um, or at the very least, that nice quote makes you feel really important if you're a lock picker. All right, I am uh, a tool member. That's the open organization of lock pickers. Uh, I was actually a co-founder of the United States chapter of that. Uh, I've since stepped down from the board, but I remain a very active member uh, and love that organization. Uh, I'm also involved with NDE Magazine. That's Non-Destructive Entry Magazine. Um, I realize I forgot to put the website on here. I'm the executive ed editor. That's N-D-E-M-A-G, M-A-G dot com. This is the DEF CON preview cover. Um, and I'm trying to tell people that's Liv Tyler, but it's not going over. Uh, anyway, uh, this will be coming out later on today, so uh, check the website and check it out. Uh, it's got a lot of information about the upcoming contests that are going to be going on all weekend long. All right, let's talk. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over what we're going to cover here today. Uh, it's a talk in four parts, basically. We're going to talk about the RoboKey system at the top. Uh, it's an incredible new lock that was very much developed within the LockSport community. They relied heavily on input from the community and uh, are well-traveled in it as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about that company and the lock that they built. Uh, we're also going to talk about QuickSet, a company that you wouldn't usually talk about in the course of you know, a high security lock discussion, whatever the case may be. Um, but they dramatically reinvented their product line, and we're going to talk about the reasons behind that, the process they went through, uh, and a little bit about what's going on with the new generation. Again, a lot of this is tied into a direct response to the LockSport community. We'll also be talking about the ABUS Plus system. This is a disk, disk detainer system, um, a near comical flaw in it, um, which was just sort of a forest for the trees thing that a lock picker came up with. Uh, he tracked down a way to decode it very consistently. Uh, the company themselves completely changed the, the design of it, and we're going to talk about the challenge they issued him after that. We'll cover the whole thing. And of course, Medico, uh, and this is where John will be talking. Uh, the uh, Medico and the magazine, NDE Magazine, worked together with, uh, with the company and John in order to release the exploit via the magazine in our last issue. Um, and John did quite a bit of work with them, and he's going to cover all the bases on that and, uh, and do a demo for you right on stage, opening up a Medico M3, their newest generation. All right, now in the uh, previous uh, slides, the ones that you'll have on the CD or on the website or whatever the case may be, there's going to be a super secret announcement. Uh, I'll tell you right now that announcement was going to be about a grant program for high security lock research. The fact of the matter is the magazine is not organized enough at this time to go forward with that, so that's going to be delayed perhaps until another con. Uh, so there's your announcement. Sorry, it's a disappointment. You ruined the surprise. <laughs> All right. Uh, first of all, I want to cover the making friends portion of this. This is fairly fast. Uh, all I really have to say about making friends is uh, don't be a jerk uh, and tell people if you see something they're wearing that looks nice. It works really, really well. Um, but as far as making friends and communicating with lock manufacturers, uh, Barry Wells, who's in the audience here today, um, he actually wrote a wonderful piece for the magazine in our last issue uh, that's kind of a simple road map to carrying out responsible disclosure. And I'm just going to kind of cover his bullet points and talk a little bit about each one of those. I think it serves as a really convenient guide to folks who are going to be involving themselves in this field at any level. First of all, be professional. Approach them professionally. Uh, approach the company with, you know, proper language. Uh, don't, you know, no leet speak or anything like this. Uh, present yourself in a respectable manner, and you're more likely to be respected. Uh, be honest. 
if you have something theoretical that you haven't actually managed to accomplish yourself, don't tell them that you've broken their lock, that everything is defeated. Uh, be, be very clear with what it is that you've done with their product, um, which transitions into being thorough. Be very distinct about what locks you attacked, how many locks they were, uh, e exactly the method by which you did it, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure that you cover all of your bases. Um, you're going to have to be very detail-oriented when you're going to be approaching a manufacturer. You, you want to have the whole package put together for them. Be very clear with them as well about your intentions behind this. What is it that you want them to do about this? Do you want to have them disclose it, do you want the product fixed, whatever the case may be. Um, the, be. Be very clear with your initial intention when you're walking in. You do not want to be misrepresented or misunderstood. Um, don't ask for money. This is one that's it's kind of almost a personal thing. There's, there's been a lot of debate about this. Um, we personally believe that once you involve money, that's when things go wrong. Especially um, if you come to a manufacturer and, for example, they offer to pay you, right there, that's the, the things can go wrong. For example, uh, shut up money. The public should know about this kind of thing. We think, and it's it's just not worth it. That's that, that's an arena that you don't want to tango in. Tango, tango, like and that. there there is a very thin line between uh, consulting and extortion. They and, can be careful if you walk. And, and it's thin to the point where they can pin you with that, you know? The, so you need to take very good care of yourself uh, when you're approaching this. Be prepared. Um, this uh, Barry outlined an extraordinary system by which he approaches new locks when they need to be reviewed. Um, he receives 10 of them. He takes eight of those, sets two aside, do all those later. Of the eight, he disassembles several of them and refines and, and attacks uh, the rest. He refines his attack. Uh, by disassembling it, you're able to see what it is they've changed to defeat your previous iteration of your attack um, so that you can update it and, and, and attack another small subset of those cylinders. Um, once you've done that, and this is very important, the two that you've set aside, those are for when they come calling, when they visit you, or when you have to visit them so that you have a sealed cylinder that they have put into your hands that you can open for them by the same methods, showing that your attack works across the bar, you know, works universally. Yes? Um, also, the purpose of uh, asking for so many locks and taking them apart, you don't want the company pulling a fast one on you. Basically, you're challenging their product and their design. You don't want them to implement features that are not standard to try to trip you up whenever you're opening these locks. Absolutely. Uh, and finally, do not sign non-disclosure agreements. Um, these will remove your ability to report on the situation independently. They will tie you to that company and they will keep you from being able to, to pursue disclosure beyond your interaction with that company. Um, you need to remain an independent agent um, and there are, there are people who can support you in this. You know, there, there is uh, the open organization of lock pickers. Barry uh, has made it clear that he's comfortable being contacted um, via the magazine. Of course, anybody at NDE, anybody at Tool US, et cetera, et cetera. There's a fantastic community out there who can support you through this. So don't sign the NDAs. Remain an independent agent when you're working on this. All right. So with the roadmap of disclosure covered, let's actually get into the meat of the talk. So this is the RoboKey system. Uh, <laughs> this should be the first time many of you have seen this. Um, it's a really nice quote out of John. Uh, it's easy to love your own baby, but we wanted to get this out into the community. We figured they wouldn't be shy about telling us what was wrong with it. <laughs> uh, it's absolutely true. <clears throat> so, a little bit of background on the company. John and Bob Laughlin, uh, Lachlan, sorry. Uh, John was a telecommunications engineer. Uh, when that bubble burst, he got together with his father, Bob, who was a retired lock engineer. Um, the two of them got together, and uh, his father had previously formed a company called Stanton Concepts with his other brother Tom. This was some um, couple of decades ago, I guess. But they revived the brand and started working together. The inspiration behind the lock and behind their uh, behind their renewed interest in the security field, um, they both have a healthy interest in security to begin with. Um, as I said, Bob was a retired lock engineer. He uh, 
He, he and a couple of folks bought out a company in Connecticut that was producing um, uh, the Tough Lock. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it. Uh, they had a huge contract with UPS in Manhattan um, and uh, brought their theft rate, I think, down from... Uh, well, I shouldn't quote numbers. I'm not 100% on. So, But uh, they, they greatly reduced it. So... Uh, they realized that the world was dramatically more interested in security than they ever had been before. Uh, not to throw the buzzword out there, but post 9-11, there were a lot of things being looked at that had not been looked at before. A lot of things that had long gone unscrutinized in security that people were now very interested in. And they saw an opportunity to build a business up around those interests. Um, the big question they had when beginning work on the RKS was how can we secure containers that have to change hands multiple times with multiple potentially authorized users that have to look through those containers and survive the conditions that those sort of shipping containers have to go through out in the sea. Um, so... Talk about the basic operation. Uh, the lock has a disk detainer appearance. Um, how it looks like, but it does not function like an alloy cylinder. Um, it has flies on each one of the disks, uh, just like a safe lock does. This is a small protrusion of metal that picks up each disk in turn. Just like when you turn a combo lock, you turn it around three times. Each individual disk picks up the one after it, the one after it and then you turn them backward to leave them behind, back to leave the next one behind. This operates the same way, but there are six, seven disks in a cylinder, um, and they're extraordinarily small as well, it's able to fit into the form factor of a normal alloy cylinder. Um, the thing with having this simple <coughs> mechanical device it's an extraordinarily rugged solution for the environmental conditions. Um, by having the mechanical end of this lock separated from the, electrical, the electronic end, which we'll talk about in a moment, it allows it to travel safely without damaging any electronic component that might otherwise be carried on a different solution to this problem. So, the automatic dialer. This is the electronic portion of it. Um, the operator of the lock does not need to know the combination. They simply have to be a valid user. This automated device, um, and I'm very sorry, I should address this right now. I do not have pictures of this at the moment. There will be some in the magazine, and I'll be providing some to DEF CON afterwards. There are plenty of pictures for the rest of the locks later on. My apologies about that. Negligent on my part. But we'll continue. <clears throat> Um, there are various potential forms of authentication to use with the automatic dialer, uh, anywhere from just a standard password, RFID solutions. Uh, they, they've even went so far as to propose an embedded dialer in a cell phone. Um, you, you literally just need a small motor that can turn count clockwise and counterclockwise, and from that point on, the whole process is authentication. So you can build these very compactly, very small. Um, and solutions all the way down to simply a matched pair. One dialer matches one lock. Um, the, the range of possibilities is fantastic. There's also a manual dialer. Uh, if there is some sort of catastrophic, catastrophic electronic failure, you're able to use a manual dialer, authenticate yourself in some other manner uh, to the person, to the owner of the cylinder or to another authorized user who can get you the actual dialed code for it and input that. And it takes a little bit of you know, tactile dexterity, but uh, they have a very nice dialer and you can accomplish it. So, that's the basic concept. First introduction. This is a fantastic story that Bob Laughlin told me recently. Uh, he met Han Fei via eBay. Uh, Han Fei is one of the preeminent lock collectors in the world, also a member of Tool, um, and a very nice guy who's sitting in the second row. Uh, he bought a lock off of Han and began talking with him. So this is fine. They're both wonderful collectors. Uh, they traded the stories back and forth, traded locks back and forth. And in late 2005, Bob happened to be traveling for Holland, traveling to Holland for an unrelated trip. And he got a hold of Han and said, you know, why don't you come up? My wife and I are going to be in town. Let's meet. Let's have lunch, whatever the case may be. And as Bob tells the story, Han said, ah, I can't. I'm 1,000 kilometers away, or I'm 100 kilometers away. I wouldn't be able to come in. But as it turned out, Tool planned a meeting the night that they were in town. So when Bob and his wife arrived, they got a phone call up to the room, and Han said, I'm here in the lobby. <clears throat> so they headed down to meet him, and Han dragged them all over town. The way Bob tells the story, it was very whirlwind, and Han's a very energetic guy to begin with. Uh, but in particular, Han invited him out to the Tool meeting, uh, which is at a sports complex uh, a little bit outside of town. And when the two of them arrived, there was a large construction site. Now, Bob Laughlin is going on 80 years old. 
Han looked around and said, well, it wasn't like this before. There was a large fence in front of him, about six feet tall. And Han started digging around, looking for a hole in the bottom of the fence. And he found, found an area in the bottom of the fence that he was able to pull up, and he invited Bob to crawl under it. Again, Bob is going on 80 years old. So Bob, good sport that he is, gets down on the ground, and he starts kind of shimmying under. And again, as Bob tells the story, Han put a foot right on his butt and shoved him right under. So <laughs> Bob popped out the other side, and there they were in the middle of the construction site, and kind of picking around in the dark, trying to get at the sports complex. So they get all the way through, and they arrive at now probably a seven or eight foot fence. And, uh, and Han kind of looks back, looks over at the fence, puts a foot up on something in the dark, and vaults himself over. And Bob, one more time, going on 80 years old, standing behind the fence looking at Han, and out of more faith than Han probably deserved at that moment, he put his foot out into the dark, found the same spot that Han had, and vaulted himself over the fence, landing on a dumpster. <laughs> so getting off of the dumpster, he notices there's a little guard station uh, out in front of this uh, complex. And the guard is noticing what's going on. The guard starts to walk out of his little door, and Han walks right in the little door, right past the guard. The guard says, well, that's not the way to get in. And Han says, oh and just walks right inside with Bob following behind him. <laughs> um, so that was the introduction of the RKS to the Locksport community. Bob said that he felt like he had been hazed, but uh, got out the other side all right. <clears throat> so after their meeting there, Barry taught Bob how to pick a lock for the first time. He had a wonderful time. The RKS was uh, uh, passed around, and the very, one of the first prototypes was looked at there. And uh, John Laughlin, his son, was invited to the Dutch Open. So at the Dutch Open, uh, John told me on the phone, he said, the people were very generous with their knowledge. And uh, that's both honest and a little bit tongue-in-cheek. The number of attacks that were tried to throw at this thing, he had a whole talk uh, at which uh, the gross majority of the conference attended and threw around ideas uh, as, as openly and wantonly as they could. Um, there was a, a wonderful panel on any viable attack uh, and, and any viable application of the lock to a matching technology or security solution as well. <clears throat> From there, uh, John attended Aloha with uh, Han and Barry as well. Uh, they were able to showcase the RKS and a couple of their other products from the company. Um, things went fairly well, and they actually got an article in the National Locksmith about the RKS out of that. Uh, so a little bit of attention was starting to be gathered around the lock. However, while they're actively seeking a licensing deal for the mechanical lock itself, they very much wanted things to move forward with the automatic dialer, get the product out into, if not the marketplace, at least the hobbyist market, where they had already found quite a bit of camaraderie and uh, and uh, <clears throat> and tete a tete. Um, Money. <laughs> <laughs> um, they wanted to get the ball rolling while they were seeking a deal. Uh, so they have a microcontroller in this auto dialer. It's a PIC uh, microcontroller. Um, they're working on the software behind it right now. We're going to have some more details about that in a couple of weeks as they become available to us. Um, but for the dialer itself, they're providing uh, all of the source code, and they're providing developer kits, which include a lock, the current version of the dialer, um, and, uh, again, all of the code backing for it. What they want is for people to take their automatic dialer or, take, or build their own automatic dialer that could interface with their cylinder, and add whatever functionality you see fit to it. Um, they are aiming to get the total package of it, the lock and the dialer kit out for about $300. And again, what they want to see, they, they're mechanical engineers. And they said to me that, you know, we're mechanical engineers. We've taken this as far as we can take it right now. We've hit land's edge. We think we have a great product. We think that any number of emerging technologies can be applied to the electronic end of this product. We want to see what people can do with it. Um, so they're opening it up to the community at large. Uh, you can have access to the microcontroller. You can have access to the dialer and the open source instructions without need for a license. You know, you, you can build a tool to interface with their lock. Um, and it, it's a little, bit, you know, a little bit reminiscent of the video game platform. Well, they've built a platform, and now they want to see third-party developers developing for it. So, uh, wah. 
And they would love to hear from you. Uh, John's always kept in touch with the folks in the Locksport community. I've been on the phone with him frequently lately. Other people have before me. He pops onto forums once in a while to kind of chat with people and see what's going on. Uh, and this is his email address. If any of you are interested in the project or if you just want to know more about it, um, feel free to contact him. And, uh, and as I said, in a couple of weeks, we'll have the full issue of NDE out with many more details, many beautiful pictures, and the details of the software backing for it. So that is the RKS. So, Quickset Smart Key. Uh, Quickset, I think, is long known to be kind of a cheap manufacturer. Uh, they're one of the cheapest people. You can walk into Home Depot and buy their lock, put it on your door. They aim themselves at the, um, at the you know, suburban housing market. Uh, yes? Has anybody here picked a Quickset? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, very good. There very good. Is. Yeah, good call. <laughs> so, uh, Quickset, well, this is a good quote, and it leads into the uh, first part here. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal uh, back in 2006, um, and I was reading it again, um, and I noticed this quote. At least lo one lockmaker says the hobbyists can help companies. And it turned out to be Walt Strader from Quickset. So I ask you, how blind were we as a community? Uh, Walt Strader told the Wall Street Journal that he had heard of bumping via the Locksport groups, via the information that was getting out there uh, because of the work of Tool, because of various forums that it was on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he told them this in 2006. And in the same article, he talked about they were creating a solution to this. You know, They were taking this seriously and creating a solution. And in the year and a half that I had that article tacked above my desk at work, partially because my face is on the front page of it, uh, in the year and a half, I had only ever read to the part about Schlage, where Schlage says that they would prefer that we keep the industry secrets in the room just like a magician's community, uh, something to that effect. And that's something you know that's always kind of riled me or whatever the case may be. But I had, I had always stopped reading just before Walt Strader said, we're coming up with a solution, and we noticed it because of the lock sport groups. So, smart key launches. This lock is 100% bump proof. It l does not have a separation of two pins. They took their entire product line and changed it. They, they removed the pin tumbler mechanism from their product. And again, this is an enormous manufacturer. And while there is fervor about bumping and scare pieces on local news and things to that effect, nobody else has, has really gone this route. No, nobody else has completely changed their product line to address this. There was no public outcry, no large enough public outcry to force this company to do this. So they were moving ahead of the curve. Uh, the smart key is rekeyable. Uh, this is not the U change concept. Uh, a lot of people say, you know, this has been around forever. U change had it. And that lock was awful, and it's off the market now. Um, and the U change was. It was. It was not a particularly good lock. Uh, the smart key, however, works on a very different principle. We're going to talk about how it works uh, in just a little bit here. They had a very subdued marketing campaign when it launched. Um, they, they certainly marketed their new product, their smart line. Uh, they also have a biometric end of this as well. Um, no particular comment on that. Um, but their, in their very first packaging, there was no mentioning of it being bump proof. Um, I talked to Walt and I asked him you know, why this was. And they said you know, they didn't want to repeat the mistakes of other manufacturers. They didn't want to come out calling their product bump proof if there was some mystical way that it could be bumped. Uh, they wanted to get it back into the hands of the Locksport community or, or you know, various people herein and, and see what damage could be done against it before they were willing to put their name on the line for that. There's a very rigorous testing process, and actually very interesting one uh, that we'll talk about as well. So how does it work? All right, I'm gonna describe some pieces of it to you, show you how they all integrate together, try to keep the pieces in your head for when I get to the fourth slide. So, this is the sidebar assembly housing, and you can see that the sidebar there fits into that top section. You can see how it's cut out there. Uh, the serrated wafers in the bottom right, um, the sidebar itself will interact with where it's marked sidebar gate, so those will be facing in towards that housing, and each of those serrated pins is going to lock into the pins that the key affects. And you'll see that very clearly in the fourth slide, but keep in your mind the way these will be integrated, and uh, you can see right here with them actually installed in that sidebar assembly housing. Uh, so again, each of those serrations 
one on each uh, wafer is going to catch one of the uh, key pins, and that's just the sidebar in the other side of it, so you can see how it fits in. So this is the actual plug, plug assembly. Uh, the driver pins are installed, and the sidebar is not on yet. When the sidebar is placed on, you can see how the key actually lifts each of those pins to a slightly different height. Uh, each one of those little teeth on the pin themselves, those are what are fitting into those serrated grooves on that wafer. And by lifting them to the different heights, it lifts it so that the sidebar in the back, here we go, so that the sidebar in the back is able to, uh, is able to press in. Hold on one second. I just want to show you that first slide one more time. So, again, see the sidebar gate? When these are all lifted up to the proper heights, the sidebar, that gate, lines up all the way across so that there's a long channel that the sidebar can drop into. So that's how the key operates normally, but the rekeying feature is particularly interesting. Um, the spring on the bottom here, there's a small metal tool that when the key is in the open position, you can slide that tool in and it will push the sidebar offline. It will actually shove it back the length of where that, sp where that spring is. At that point, you're able to remove the key because the pins are no longer interacting with the serrations. When you put the new key in, it will lift the pins up to different heights, unique to the new key. When you allow the sidebar to slide back onto it, the sidebar has locked each of the wafers in place and each of the pins will line up with a new serration on each one of the wafers, giving you a new key combination. So that's how they're rekeyable. It's a, it's a very interesting solution to the problem. Um, and they're instantly rekeyable by the home user. Uh, we hear from locksmiths occasionally people screw this up one way or another, and locksmiths are still seeing them every now and then, but for the most part, they seem to be doing pretty well. So I had mentioned that they had a rigorous testing process. Um, I'm going to have a sip of water, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so first of all, uh, we saw it at the 2006 Dutch Open. Uh, we didn't have the name of the manufacturer at that time. We simply saw a prototype of it. Um, we, the word got around fairly quickly who in particular it was. Um, there we go, prototype from an unnamed company. Uh, uh, the Atomeister. Um, as I remember it, he was the first person to open it, and it took him, I don't know, a little under 20 minutes, I think, the first time. He continued to work with it and got dramatically better with it. Um, but, uh, but we all got the chance to sort of see it and see it pulled apart um, that early. So already they were putting it in the hands of people who could bring it to the locksmith community. Um, and it was providing a definite challenge to people there. I mean, it was obviously not going to be bumpable. Uh, you know, we could just see that just from the manufacturer of it. Um, and people picking it, they were certainly getting through it, but it was providing a real challenge to some of the best pickers around. Yes? Did he really? No. Oh, wow. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for any of you who didn't hear that, I didn't realize this, actually. Um, I was fairly new to the field at the time. Uh, Archmeister's kind of a big guy, uh, and apparently he managed to force the sidebar. He managed to actually damage the lock in order to, you know, destructively open it, um, which I didn't realize. That's, uh, that's surprising. So, yes, it was certainly providing a challenge. Yes, hon? Yes. Yes. Really? Wow. Uh, so uh, so the, the, the pins themselves are actually bent out of shape, the, the teeth. Yeah, the, the, the teeth that interact with it, yes? Yeah, they were actually completely bent out of shape, and, uh, uh, and Han was able to investigate it afterwards. Um, that's excellent. Uh, so, the, so they took that and fixed it. I can't believe I didn't know this. This is amazing. Um, so they, they, they took it then and they redesigned it before it actually went into full production. Um, and it's interesting. This will dovetail nicely with something they're doing in the new generation as well. Um, so uh, that's very interesting. I just learned something as well. It's a good talk. Uh, so they also took it to Japan. Um, and lock testing in Japan is very interesting. Um, there's a very different culture of entry in Japan to begin with. Um, now, I, I have this from a couple of sources. Uh, if people are lying to me, you can let me know after in the Q&A. Uh, but here's how I understand it. In Japan, 
the thieves still have that sense of uh, extraordinary politeness, and they do not want to damage anything as they illegally enter your home. So where in America one of the bigger concerns is somebody throwing a brick through your window, in Japan there are actually people actively, surreptitiously um, defeating the locking mechanisms on people's houses. Yes? Which you have to respect on a technical level. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Um, so they have a very interesting method of testing, which uh, actually reminds me quite a bit of some uh, lockpicking competitions that we have here. Um, they will take some accomplished lock pickers, I assume uh, either locksmiths or professionally working with the testing organization or whatever the case may be, and they'll have a panel of them um, who will each receive the lock and they'll begin picking the lock. <clears throat> and they will try to pick it in five minutes and they'll try to pick it in, and if they can't get it open in five minutes, they reduce the field a little bit to the people who are, seem to be uh, you know, the best of that, and that smaller field will try to accomplish it in ten minutes. And, uh, and if they can't accomplish it, they, they reduce the field again to, I think, maybe about four of the most accomplished people. And those people are given 15 minutes to pick the lock. And this is the way in which you get your rating for how resistant your lock is to surreptitious entry. Well, they passed the 15-minute attacks with flying colors in Japan. Um, the lock withstood the attacks of, uh, the, the surreptitious attacks of, uh, of the pickers in Japan, even at the 15 minute mark. Um, and again, most people that I've talked to in our community who get the locks for the first time, we usually see times of uh, around 20 minutes, maybe a little bit less when they first start working with them. Uh, again, people get better with them, you know, you continue to practice. Of course, you improve your times on every lock. Um, but, uh, but, w but first time in hand, we're looking 15, 20 minutes. So the smart key too. This is a new generation. Um, this is yes. Uh, so once again, they have updated the materials for destructive entry concerns. Um, more destructive entry concerns came out after the lock hit production. Uh, a lot of them around the lock sport community themselves. Um, and Black and Decker took that information um, and they they updated some of the the physical materials that they're actually using in the lock. Um, we're getting the details of all of that once again for the upcoming issue of the magazine. Um, so we'll have a whole display of exactly what changes they made along the way. What we know is that they're addressing destructive entry concerns that grew out of the community um, of attacks that uh, were theorized by folks in the Locksport community. Um, once again, this is a similarly subdued uh, rollout to the first generation. Um, as a matter of fact, they're out right now. Uh, the, <clears throat> if you go today and you buy a lock that's been put on the shelf in the last month, you're buying a new generation of this that's been updated. They simply started rolling out the updated version of their product and getting it immediately out on the shelves to their vendors. So, uh, as far as Smart Key is concerned, uh, as, far as, as far as Quickset is concerned, and the Black and Decker Corporation, who also owns Wiser up in Canada, who are also have their own version of the Smart Key, uh, what does the future hold? Well, first of all, there are Black and Decker employees who are actively keeping an eye on the Locksport community. They have people in their organization who read the blogs, who check out the forums, who uh, are, are actively accepting submissions of attacks on their locks. Um, and to my knowledge, and uh, you know, I'm continuing to come up in this field, but to my knowledge, they're the first American manufacturer that has taken that dramatically a proactive stance, um, actively keeping an eye on what developments are coming out of our community. And this is great for them because, you know, A, it led to some of the current advances in the lock, and B, it provides them additional free feedback just constantly um, from a group of people who obviously look at their product in a different way than they would. So uh, lastly, they seem to be still excited for future collaboration. Um, Walt in particular uh, is uh, working on an article with us for the magazine um, and very interested to see what new attacks are coming out. Uh, right now in particular, uh, that's been sort of developing over the last couple of weeks and the last month or so, uh, there seems to be a very specific decoding attack on the lock. Um, the details are a little bit fuzzy at the moment, but some people seem to be having limited success with it. A little bit of it's still theoretical, um, but when that information hits the company, we'll be very interested to see what they do with it. All right. <clears throat> Doing good. This one's really clever. <laughs> this one's fun. Um, here. Do you want to grab me? Yeah, My secretary. <laughs> so the Abus Plus system. Uh, Yako Fagerlund is, uh, we call him everybody's favorite Finn. He's a really goofy guy and a really nice guy. Uh, thank you. And... Uh, as he said in this quote here, I suppose that nobody thought you could actually look behind the disks. 
So the ABIS is a disk detainer system, much like an Abloy. It has a small series of disks, um, and we'll show you individual pictures of the disks in just a moment. So a little bit of background on the exploit. Uh, there's a guy in the community named Zeke, and he actually provided all of the pictures for us and the diagrams of the quick set as well. Uh, he's a wonderful member of the community uh, and has been kind of an inspiration to a lot of us, particularly on the American side of things. Um, so everyone seems to have missed this flaw. It was very forest for the trees to the point where um, a gentleman named uh, Michael out of Germany was actually uh, participating in this contest that Zeke held that was inviting everyone to write sort of high security articles to benefit Lockpicking 101's advanced section to kind of drum up some more interest in that back end. And uh, Michael took this lock and he did a breakdown of it and he explained how it worked and talked about maybe some theoretical picking of it or whatever the case may be. Um, but he didn't see what this flaw was. And I know I'm doing a lot of dramatic building up to it, but, uh, but you'll see just how obvious it probably should have been. Uh, so Yako created a proof of concept for this, um, and he submitted it to the contest and uh, won, in fact. He took, well, I don't know, he tied for the win with somebody else. But, uh, uh, but yes, it was very, very well received in the community. So here's how it works. All right. You can all see that fairly clearly. Do you see the four on the left-hand side of it? That's actually stamped into the disk. And that four is the code for that disk. Yeah, you see where we're going. <laughs> So, uh, now th that's not a big deal. There's another disk that's placed over it. However, when you turn that disk to 90 degrees, as you do when operating this lock, the four continues to be revealed. I don't know how clear it is for you there, but you can still see the gross majority of that four. And again, it's stamped into the disk. So, he took a little bit of blue tack, and he put it on the end of a tool that he had built, and uh, inserted it through his lock, turned it 90 degrees, pulled it back, like so, and he got a very nice, and I know it's hard to see at this distance in his lighting, but he gets a very clear impression of the actual number and simply writes that number down, and he has that disk decoded. He knows what that is. He can get a key cut once he gets all of the disks decoded in that manner. So, yes? This is a high security lock that as long as you stick something tacky in it, will tell you exactly how to cut the key <laughs> with numbers. <laughs> and, uh, and in America, at least, the key control on this lock isn't particularly great. Um, after trying this method out myself and refining it a little bit, um, and we'll talk about it here, the goal of the simplification, uh, we wanted to build the simplest version of Yako's tool that we possibly could. Uh, we wanted it to be inexpensive as we possibly could as well. Uh, we wanted to prove that this exploit could be carried out by someone with very little money, very little time, and very little experience. Uh, so the tool that we constructed, uh, we took the advice of a couple of fellow lock pickers and we filed down the head of a nail. Um, just a, a large head of nail, we filed down the head of it and we filed down the shaft of it. And then on the back side of it, so that it would fit into the keyway, we filed it down. On the back side of it, we put, uh, we tried a bunch of different things, but nothing was really working. What finally worked really, really well was white glue. If you allow it to settle and uh, get, you know, n no longer tacky, but still, uh, still slightly malleable, you get that nice film over it. If any of you have ever put glue on your fingers to get your, you know, yeah, I used to do that all the time. Uh, whoop. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, and there was a big problem with the glue. I thought I had a bullet about it. There was a big problem with the glue in that it would wick up the shaft. Um, and when the glue would wick up the shaft and dry that way, you couldn't really get an impression of it at all. It wasn't working whatsoever. Um, so uh, on the advice of uh, Josh Neckrep, who's the president of Locksport International, uh, he said that we should uh, just drill out a little bit of a hollow in each side of the of the head of the nail, and uh, and that way the glue would settle itself into that little bit of a hollow, and there'd be a nice layer just sitting right at the top, and that worked beautifully. We were able to get nice, clear impressions. Uh, so that was the concept. Uh, alerting Abus. So the first contact came via an LP101 member named uh, MH on LP101. He works on the magazine as well. His name is Michael Hubler, a uh, wonderful guy out of Germany. Uh, and he contacted Avis directly. 
So the initial response uh, was probably from their customer support. It was very polite, uh, but very non-committal, saying things to the effect of, you know, nobody has opened this without uh, use of a proper key before. Uh, you know, they're very high security, towing the company line. But again, very polite and, and considering uh, what they were saying. So Yeko made a PDF of this with the proof of concept. When that made its way through, we got an immediate, they got an immediate response. Um, and the response was, there's a brief silence, and then they updated their entire current line of production. Uh, the, so MH got back something saying, you know, we're sending this off to our R&D department. Um, we'll have them look at it. Thank you so much for submitting this. And uh, there was a brief pause, and Yeko and everybody just kind of thought, well, that's probably the end of it. Nothing's really going to happen. And, uh, and then they got the message saying, you know, we're changing everything. So now, inside of their locks, they have both stamped and not stamped disks. The reason they have a mixed production is fairly straightforward. You don't want to remove that much stock. Uh, you know, they have a lot of money invested in those little bits of money to begin with, so by mixing up the production, it, you know, defeats this attack to begin with, and they're able to, to move forward with the mixed stock. Uh, so, very interestingly, they then uh, sent Yeko a new lock of the mixed production. And in that lock, uh, as I said, there were some stamped, some not stamped, and they said to him, if you open this, we will send you the keys for it and the card to get the new keys cut. <coughs> pardon me. And, uh, <coughs> pardon me. So yes, Yeko could only get the keys if he was able to decode it, if he was able to uncover the bidding and send to them what the exact bidding was. So, Yeko Zabe's plus pick. There was a brief silence. Uh, Yeko himself uh, had no machining training whatsoever. He didn't have any tools to accomplish this. Uh, so until his birthday, when he received a mini lathe from his father, uh, he didn't do anything on this. He really wasn't able to move forward with making a pick. He had ideas for it. He had great ideas for it. He had plans for it, but nothing was happening. So. Uh, a lot of his work has been community funded. Uh, there have been people who have donated um, uh, mini milling attachments for the lathe. There have been people who have donated a knurling attachment. And there are people who are now today actively purchasing the tools that he's made from him so that he can fund his next trip out to the Dutch Open um, and talk about everything that he's done. Uh, so he did successfully pick the challenge lock. And uh, we have a little bit of video of it uh, that I'm going to show here in a moment. Ahem. But... Here it is opened. Um, and I want to redress one thing that I was saying about the key control. Uh, when, we had the, uh, when we had the small prototype, the nail and the glue and all of that sort of stuff, um, after getting the code for it, we sent off to a uh, bike lock seller, uh, one on, online, and they had a very simple form where you would input your name and you would uh, tell them how you wanted to pay. You could pay by check, money order, credit card, whatever you wanted to do. And then you would put in the bidding of the key and they would cut it for you and send it off to you. Um, so just to be cheeky, I had it sent to Emmanuel Goldstein at a different address uh, and it came and it worked beautifully in the lock. Uh, so the key control uh, was additionally subpar. So uh, with that being subpar, uh, you know, you, you need the lock itself to be better security. So, I'm going to show a little video. Uh, John, in just a moment here, is going to be speaking about uh, his work with Medico. Um, and it's a great story and ongoing as well. You guys are wondering, why is this guy sitting over here so quiet? This handsome I'm just guy. waiting. <laughs> um, all right. I'm going to... All right, I'm going to do this double time. In the actual time, it takes him just about three minutes. Um, <clears throat> so how you pick the disk container lock is you insert the tool into the lock, and you're actually manipulating each disk in turn. Um, when he first picked it, it took him just over three minutes that time as well. Um, and uh, it took him three passes through the lock. So he goes through each of the disks. And when he was doing it the first time, he was trying to decode at the same time, crossing out each of the numbers that uh, didn't make sense. You know, he, where he would put the pick and it was obvious that that couldn't be the possible position. He'd keep a little chart and he'd mark it off. He was very meticulous about the way in which he went about uh, decoding it. Um, so 
as he picks here. Uh, disk detainer locks are considered, uh, you know, very difficult to pick for beginning lock pickers to begin with, um, particularly because we tend not to have access to the tools for it, though there are some manufacturers that sell tools for different brands. Um, and additionally, just because the, the way in which they operate is so unique um, to us. Uh, and yet the technology has been around for more than 100 years. The Abloy company, uh, who right now have likely the highest security lock on the planet in the Abloy ProTech, it's a disk detainer based system as well. Um, and, and fantastic. Yes? Um, Abloy basically works like a safe lock, except that there's no it's dial. Open, sorry. It's, yeah. yeah. Woo! Go, Yako. Incredible work. And then he tries to get his pick out of it for a while. He, he gets it out, don't worry. I'm sorry, you were saying, though. Go ahead. No, um, Abloy basically works like a safe lock, you know, a little dial, except there's no dial. All of the uh, wheels are set by uh, angled cuts on a key. So you have to somehow get in there and manipulate those, and that's exactly what Yako did. Aha. Aha. All right. Uh, my pleasure to reintroduce John King. Hey everybody. Um, this portion of the talk is going to be about Medico and my experience with them. Um, my name is John King. I've, um, I'm currently working for the United States Navy uh, active duty. I thankfully got to take leave and come out here to DEF CON as well as uh, Hope earlier. Um, I've been a lock sport hobbyist for about three years now. I started off on the easy locks just like all of you and now I focus mostly on uh, the high security stuff because I find it just so much fun. Um, I've been a security geek for a long, long time. I started off with, uh, you know, the, the the same things most of you do, you know, security exploits, uh, network uh, attacks, things like that. And I moved on to locks. Um, what I am not doing, I am not speaking on behalf of the Navy, although I am a sailor. Um, what I say here is does not represent their views. Or uh, Especially anything the cursing. like that. <laughs> yeah, sailors don't curse. <laughs> um, I'm also not speaking on behalf of Medico, although I've had uh, in-depth conversations with them. My memory is not perfect, and I'm not a representative of their company. So if I say something, uh, take it with a grain of salt. Let's see. Okay, why did I go after Medico? Um, for a long, long time, I saw them as the holy grail of pin tumbler locks. I think a lot of people still do. They uh, have a frightening reputation. There was a time when if somebody said they opened a Medico, it, would, um, it was met with a lot of skepticism. You know, okay, you did it once, can you do it again? That, that sort of thing. A lot of YouTube comments. Yeah, YouTube <laughs> comments. Oh my God, fake. You know. The whole trick with Medico is that the pins must both lift up like a regular lock and they also have to rotate to the proper angles. Um, there were lots of attempts by the community to develop tools and techniques to open these locks. Um, the one that sticks out in my head is one by a guy named Lock Newbie 21 and he's not a newbie at all. He developed a uh, raking tool that um, a lot of people may be able to consistently open Medicos with, but uh, I'm not a fan of raking. I go for the more uh, methodical approach. Okay, I'm going to attempt to demonstrate in one slide how Medico works. There it is. <laughs> All right. You guys see the key, yeah? The cuts on that key are angled. It's not like your normal house key. You see they're kind of skewed to the left and to the right. And what that does is it rotates the pins. There's a pin on the right over there. It's got the slot going on the side of it. That little chisel tip fits into those cuts. And when it does, it rotates the pin to the angle that it sets it to. Now, remember I said that they have to lift and rotate. There's a portion of this lock that isn't shown. It's the rest of it, the outer shell. So imagine the rest of the lock working like a normal one. But the part that really gives medical the security is the rotations and the sidebar. The top plug up there is one that is not... Um, is not rotated properly. The third pin from the front, if you can see it, it's the one that shows up the best. It's kind of skewed over to the right, that groove. What's happening is that there's a bar that has to drop into those slots. There's one tooth on that bar for every single pin. 
once you align all of those um, pins to the proper rotation, those grooves will line up with teeth on the sidebar, and it can retract and the plug can turn. The plug on the bottom over there, the bottom right, has all the grooves lined up. That has the proper key inserted. So you can see that bar with those teeth on it can just drop right in, and the plug can turn and the lock will open. I found some problems <laughs> when I started looking at it. The first one is open grooves. This is the most obvious. Those grooves alongside the pins, they go all the way through to the bottom. And this means that we have a way to manipulate the rotation. That's been the, the big thing, is how do you control the rotation of little cylindrical pins? And everybody's been trying to do it, and recently anyway, this seems to be the first time somebody's, somebody's figured this out. If you take a bent piece of wire, you can hook in there, and by pushing and pulling, you can control the rotation of the pin. Now, the trouble with this is that you still don't know where to rotate it to. You have control, but you don't know what rotation to set them to. And that's where the other problem comes in. Even spacing. This is, really is a built-in des, uh, design, um, I don't want to call it a flaw, because I can't think of another way to do it. I'm not an engineer, though. You'll notice in this open Medeco lock, all of these grooves are evenly spaced to meet up with those teeth on the sidebar. This spacing has not changed since um, 1969, when the first edition of Medeco came out. It's 0.17 inches between each one of those grooves. This does not change by bidding. So now we know where the grooves need to go, and we have a way to control them. So how do we uh, leverage this to actually open the locks is the question. Um, we start, I started from humble beginnings. I wanted to, um, the, 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 what I wanted to do was hook into all the grooves at once and kind of do a little wiggle and magic it opens. That wasn't realistic. It turns out it's really hard to hook into six grooves at once with little tiny pieces of wire. So that's what I tried. These designs did not work at all. So then I said, um, maybe I'll simplify and try one pin at a time to get used to it. Eventually, the goal was to work up to doing all at once. But it turned out there was a better way. You can actually rotate medical pins and open, a, and open one of the locks with a tool like this, a bent piece of wire. And uh, it, it works all right, but it, it, it's a pain. So... That second problem I found with the even spacing, knowing where to position those grooves. This is just to show you how the tool started out. I'll explain a little bit more about how the tool itself works. I just want you to see kind of the evolution here. I started off with these scales printed on paper. I used chisels to stamp them into the brass. You know, there's a lot of uh, poor silver soldering here. And then I found J.B. Weld. And it was glorious. It turns out that JB Weld plus the ghetto lathe. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, I'm not a machinist. But I do have access to a power drill and clamps. Thank you. So what I did was, I took my power drill, I clamped it to my desk, and shoved a piece of uh, brass tubing in it, and stabilized it as much as possible. This, this is not a good way to cut scales. <laughs> I, I get about one in five of them right, which is why production is so slow, for those of you who are waiting for tools. <laughs> but it does work. And what I do is I angle a hacksaw blade off of my desk into the spinning brass, um, always wearing safety goggles. And I watch it and hope it doesn't wobble off, you know. And uh, eventually you end up with a, uh, a good scale. And this is what happens whenever all this comes together. You end up with these nice, purdy-looking tools. Um, this is one that had, I made to have a replaceable tip. Um, let's see. If, um, let's see. Can you go back? Oh, the, yeah, previous. There we go. Damn it. Let's see. Okay, um, you can't see it. 
What's holding that wire in the middle is an X-Acto knife handle, which turns out works, works really well for holding bits of wire. And then I use JB Weld again, and I fix it in place so it doesn't move. I think the last one shows that one. Okay. Um, this one had a replaceable tip, so the idea was if the wire bent or broke, you'd, you could replace it without having to um, bug me to make you a new tool. <laughs> that one's out of aluminum, looks like. Oh, and uh, that's another one. It's got a stainless steel jacket, and I just every time I make one of these, I try to experiment and do something new. Um, this is the point in the talk where I'm going to try and demonstrate this. I'm going to attempt to open a Medeco M3. It's their latest uh, generation of this lock. Um, I'm going to be fair in the interest of full disclosure and admit that I have opened this lock many times. But it's still a medical and it shouldn't be able to be opened, you know, in this manner. So I'm going to give it a shot and Skylar is going to provide some witty commentary. <laughs> uh, and if we can get the camera in on John, then uh, excellent. <clears throat> All right, we... Uh, we were looking forward to a desktop camera, or a tabletop camera, um, but uh, yeah, we probably should have checked in again recently. Uh, <laughs> what you looking for there, buddy? I'm just going to try and find the uh, key here. Oh, okay. Maybe I won't be able to find it. John loses keys. <laughs> it's not usually a problem. <laughs> um, we... Uh, John got a hold of uh, Doug Farr, who was acting as the uh, non non-destructive entry magazine's editor in chief at that time. Uh, he was helping the magazine get back on its feet, and uh, John got a hold of him, wanting to publish uh, an article about this. So, all right, here we go. Anyhow, I can't do it. You guys have to boo really loud. <laughs> he's he's going to be first, he says. Uh, anyhow, uh, so John came to us uh, wanting to publish an article. He came to Doug wanting to publish an article. Um, and, uh, and there was a lot of interest in it. Uh, Doug and all of us at the magazine were obviously very excited to do it. Um, however, uh, Peter Field, uh, the head of research and development at Medico, had attended the 2007 Dutch Open. Um, and uh, myself and another member of the magazine, uh, John Naughton, were able to attend that. And he gave this talk where he began the talk. The very first thing he said when he introduced himself was, and in case no one has done it yet, I want to welcome all of you to our industry. And he approached his time there um, at the conference with completely open arms, completely open to talking to us about some, uh, he gave a four hour talk that ended up running to almost five hours um, about the engineering and the design of locks uh, throughout history and uh, with a lot of very specific examples. He seemed like a very open guy and very interested to communicate with all of us, so when it came across my desk I said, let's try to get a hold of Peter. Um, so via Hanfei, uh, he put us in, back in contact with Peter, um, and then we began our conversation with him. Oh, I thought you almost had it, so I wrapped up. I thought I did too. Oh, jeez. This is getting right, awkward. Right. <laughs> um, John actually, just a couple of weeks ago, was doing this on stage at Hope, um, and, uh, well, I don't know, he did it there, so... <laughs> I don't think he was any better rested. He was partying all through Hope as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, our interactions with Peter have been pretty good so far. Peter came right on down. Do you, do you have this in the rest of your talk? Should I stop talking? No, no, you can go right ahead. Okay, all right. They'll give me uh, stalling for time. <laughs> good. Um, so... When we first got a hold of Peter, his, uh, you know, his first request was, can you hold the article until we can actually see this in person, until we can evaluate it? So that's exactly what we did. Um, we hinted that we had something coming up, that we were talking to Medico, that we were working with them, etc. Um, and, uh, and Peter drove to, drove to, the bay, or to uh, John's apartment, and I drove down from Boston, and we were both driving to Virginia, um, Peter, however, lived in Virginia. I, uh, I had a longer drive. Um, 
But anyway, uh, so we sat around, we talked for several hours, again, went over um, any number of very interesting things in lock engineering, and, uh, and, different, and, and particularly the different exploits that have been taken against Medeco over the years, and how they have iteratively responded to each one of those. A um, couple of really interesting attacks that he reviewed with us. Um, so from there, uh, we had a hard deadline. We had a hard publication deadline uh, that we wanted to put the magazine out for. So we said, you know, what, what do you want? Can we publish at this point? When can we expose this? And Peter came in saying, you know, we realize the attack is legit. We're updating the production line. Um, and John will talk uh, about the new pins that they're installing in the locks. Um, but as far as the publication deadline was concerned, we had to get something out. We had to get something out very soon. Um, so Peter wrote a letter an open letter to the community talking about the process that we were going through. We weren't ready to reveal yet. We weren't ready to talk about the actual exploit yet. But he provided to the magazine, which was important to me because the magazine's my baby and I really wanted to, you know, have something interesting out there. Um, he provided a letter talking about the work that we were doing with Medico, talking a little bit about John, um, and provided us... Uh, a fan, the, the quote that we started the uh, piece off with, which is, who is John King and what is he doing with our locks? <clears throat> what are you doing with their locks? <laughs> Not opening them at DEF CON. <laughs> <laughs> yes! We'll see. Woo! We'll see. Um, when Peter came out, it was, uh, it was a really good time. Like I said, we talked for hours about uh, just locks, exploits, responsible disclosure, all that good stuff. Um, and what they eventually, what we eventually agreed on was that we should re that um, they should reimplement a system called ARX, Attack Resistance Extended. It's a, uh, it was a pin type that was introduced back in '94, but it wasn't standardized. There was a uh, government tool that works in a similar basis to mine, and the pins that protected against it were not available to the general public for the most part. It wasn't advertised because it wasn't a perceived threat. In fact, in fact, they had actually stopped production of them and they were working out of back stock for uh, many years. Oh! Hey! Nothing like a little pressure, yeah? <laughs> um, but uh, I'm going to pass it back over to John. But as I was just saying, uh, they, they had actually stopped production on the pins altogether. And it was one of the reasons that we had to wait on the article, um, because they literally had to get the machines up and running again. Um, they had to get the parts in to get the machines operating as they were producing these pins. So they had a large back stock, which they had been working out of for private batches for a while. Um, and as I said, I'll pass it back over to John. Nice work. Thank you, Skylar. Um, as you can see, this tool is not ridiculously easy to use. Fake. You know, yeah, <laughs> fake. <laughs> That's uh, F-A-E-K. It's spelling on that. Um, can we get it back to the uh, laptop? I don't know, if that, yeah, is that under yeah, our we're control? Back. We're back. Aha, excellent. Now let's see what the rest of it. We probably covered some of this. Okay, um, some of the people that helped me out... Lockpicking101.com, I, I don't want to pitch individual forums because this is a big community. We've, we're spread out quite a bit, but I have to acknowledge LP101. This is um, basically a, from, the, from day one, from those little rake comb tools that I produced, I started posting the results of what I had done on there and asking for feedback. You know, what do you guys think? Bouncing ideas around. All the way through to the finished product and, and, and beyond. They've been covering this and everyone's really excited about it. And it's, uh, it's good to note Abus, uh, the, uh, Yeko's work with Abus was also, uh, directly via LP101, his contact there. I had mentioned it before, but uh, good to renote in this context. Um, this community is the reason why I was able to contact Medico and the reason why the locks are, are being fixed is, um, like I said, this, this ARX standard, I'm going to have a slide up in a minute, is um, being implemented as standard across the lock so that this tool is no longer effective, which is a very good thing. There's nothing, there's nothing better than seeing, than seeing my tool being made, uh, being made uh, not able to use. Um, like Skyler said, D Doug Farr was instrumental in getting us in contact with Han Fei, who got us in contact with Peter Field. Mitch Capper provided support in the form of... Uh, many medical locks, him and several others in the community provided me with 
lots of practice material to see, you know, how universal is this? Is this does this work against originals? Is this work against biaxials? Is this work against M3? And the answer to all those questions is absolutely yes. Um, if I left anyone out, I apologize. Uh, as Scholar said, we wanted to get manufacturer reaction from Medico. Um, Peterfield came out, and uh, this is not an ARX pen, although it's on the slide. This is an <laughs> this is a closed groove original pen. We sometimes call them uh, ARX predecessor. This this technique was figured out back in the 70s. This is not new. And at the time, Medico closed off the grooves after doing some legal and uh, financial wrangling with that company. They put them out of business. Basically. But at the same time, they closed up the grooves. Great. Now you can't slip the wire in there and the, the tool is no longer effective. That one only probed. It, it wasn't actually able to rotate the pins. It just kind of probed up so you could decode the angle so you could cut a key, or in this case, assemble a key from parts. Um, for some reason, in 1985, when they came out with biaxial, they opened the grooves back up. And what we believe this is due to is cost. Um, they had bought up all the tools off the market, mostly, and this, is really, this, this was really not seen as a threat anymore, especially since the tool that was on the market was, it didn't fit the keyway, you know. It, it was simple little things, but the concept was still solid. So they opened the grooves back up because it, it was cheaper to produce and there wasn't as much of a threat in their eyes. Well, and uh, to be clear about the old tool, um, it was built using a makeup key, um, a makeup key that you would insert into the lock in small chunks. That key, however, were actually medical keys. Um, so what brought them down legally was the fact that uh, it, was a, it was an infringement case because they were actually using a physical medical product branded and protected in order to sell their product. Um, and by the time they were shut down, Biaxial hadn't come out yet. So when Biaxial came out and uh, there were four and aft positions as well, it became slightly more complex, and the old tool, the current version of the old tool, was no longer effective, so they moved on. Now, had I known all this and that the patent existed, I probably could have saved myself a lot of time. <laughs> I figured this thing out, like, you know, you can see I started from a very strange perspective, this comb-like attack, you know, and then I kind of worked it in the other direction. You know, I, I, I wish I had seen it. You know, I, after I made the tool and it worked, I started looking around to see if anybody else had figured it out. You know, I was maybe I'll patent the thing. You know, and then I found out, oh, somebody beat me to it like 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and again, not to, just to give John his due, John's tool specifically aids in the picking of the locks. It actually allows you to have an effective hand tool for attacking the locks. The old ones just decoded it. You'd have to walk away and get your key cut. The other difference is. Those required, um, I'm not going to say sophisticated machining, mine requires $10 in a trip to Ace Hardware. <laughs> a terrible drill lathe. <laughs> um, th this is kind of my little bit about the future. Um, just because we're breaking Medico all over the place, Medico is, is, is really getting slammed this year especially due to my stuff. And uh, Mark Tobias, he's giving a talk right after this about some of the stuff him and Toby Blues Manis have done with Medico. Just because we've broken this thing is not a reason to stop. I think we should keep going. You know, they say Abloy Protec, uh, Eva MCS, uh, all, all these locks are these these Goliaths that are never going to be picked. Um, bullshit. I think that we need to keep going no matter what. If somebody says you can't do it, then do it, and don't stop until you find a way. Um, disclosure. This is kind of tying in. When we find something really exciting, our, my first thought is, let's put it on the internet. You know, I want to talk to people about this. All that we ask that you think before you disclose, it could be something significant that could affect, you know, public safety, not to sound corny, but it could affect a lot of people in ways that, in ways that you're not thinking about. You know, to, to us, it seems like these locks are like toys almost. You know, we don't think about the real security implications when we're messing with them. I, I don't anyway. You know, it's a puzzle. <laughs> um, also, don't get wrapped up and have fun. There's a lot of politics associated with this. Disclosure and networking and, you know, am I irritating this person? Am I pissing off this guy? You know, how does the manufacturer feel? If you have a good sense of humor and you just have fun with it, it's a lot easier. Let's see. What do we got next? Final thoughts. Those, those, are, those are my final thoughts. Oh. 
I mean, you, 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 do you have some final thoughts? Yeah, that was kind of my final thoughts. Um, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll give Skylar's talk. Screw it, right? Please help. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm running low. He he does not need another beer right now. <laughs> um, here, thank you. Us lock pickers, we, we consider ourselves a fairly creative people, but nothing compared to some of the people in this room at this conference. There's a lot of really creative people walking around here, and all it, sometimes all it takes is a new perspective to solve to solve one of these problems. Even though these are mechanical, and most of us here deal deal in the digital world. I mean, we're we're hackers. And that's what it's about. Would you like to? If you don't mind. Thank you. Um, we, uh, as John said, uh, we're starting to get our feet in the door um, with various manufacturers. The name of the talk is, you know, uh, Making Friends and Influencing Lock Manufacturers. We're starting to get our foot in the door in various places. Um, we're meeting a lot of people, finding out that a lot of people know each other, maybe some people don't. Um, we're becoming the hub for a lot of really amazing lock pickers, meeting a lot of really interesting, uh, dominant, whatever companies. Um, and the communities are starting to merge as well, uh, the, the hacker and the lockpicking communities. Uh, I mean, look at DEF CON, of course. Um, it, the lockpicking village now has two rooms. There are five contests this year for lockpicking. Uh, we, you know, thank you for embracing us. Uh, it's been uh, fantastic. Uh, so as our communities merge, there's one very important thing that needs to be remembered is that the physical security disclosure is different than digital security disclosure. Um, and I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit before the want to help. Uh, in digital security, there is a dis typically a distributed network by which to distribute a patch or a fix to whatever the problem may be. The internet exists. Um, if you have any thoughts, feel free to chime in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I'm just kind of hanging out, you know. No, no worries, no worries. <laughs> um, so uh, there's an immediate distributed way to get to your customers and fix your install base. With locks, it's dramatically harder to fix your install base. When Medico told us that they were going to try and implement this within two months and, and get it all off the line and running, um, that sounded pretty pretty good. You know, this, these are physical changes to their you know, their entire, the entire lineup. And we, we, we thought it was reasonable for, for two months, you know, maybe a month, maybe three months. It's the window of time that we should allow them to fix these problems, I think should be a lot larger than what we give software manufacturers or software uh, vendors. And because again, it, it takes quite a lot of legwork, quite a lot of literally person to person work um, in order to get the, everything out the door. Um, specifically with Medico, they were able to get the fix into every new lock coming off the line, but from there they had to move down to their locksmiths who are vending, who are distributing their product, uh, try to get the part into their hands. They have the new part on the market. Go ahead. Um, if you guys are related in any way to the uh, physical security of a facility, I would recommend that you contact your local Medico dealer, if you have Medico on your, on your uh, doors, and start asking about an ARX pin kit. This information has not quite reached, reached the dealers with the um, enthusiasm that we think it should. If you guys bug them enough, it's going to get out there. And it has to. It's, they're available right now. I'm trying to remember what the... Uh, I, I believe the part number is K-5004. But you can go to ndemag.com. Issue number four has that part number as well as... A little, some more details about how the tool works and what we ran into. Um, so, uh, as we were saying, with that, that deep an install base, and we're noticing that companies uh, in this, companies, uh, physical security companies in this age don't seem to have built the infrastructure needed to uh, disseminate this sort of information. Um, what we've noticed in dealing with Medico is that there seem to be a lot of things that are very discreetly one person's responsibility or one department's responsibility, and the intercommunication uh, from our outsider perspective seems to be off. Uh, as John was saying, um, the, the, the new pin kits haven't been, the, the information that they exist, while it's now in the new catalog and whatever the case may be, the need for them and the reason that they've been introduced doesn't seem to be making it all the way down the chain. 
these new pin kits are expensive. Okay. Uh, also true. Your locksmith is not going to upgrade your pins. They're not going to upgrade your locks. They're not going to upgrade your security unless you demand it. And given that we are um, talking about this in public with Medico's blessing, I think it'd be a good idea to upgrade your locks now if you have them. <laughs> Just a thought. And again, and this is another one of the big distinctions between physical security and digital security. With your physical security solution, you as the end user are dependent on your vendor to update that fix. And if your vendor doesn't want to spend the money individually on their end to, to get the part in that you need, if they are simply ignorant of what the problem is or willfully ignorant, whatever the case may be, you do not have the opportunity to patch your own system. Conversely, if a patch is released on the internet, you are able to make the decision for yourself whether or not you want to update your system with it, whether or not you personally want to apply it to your own, uh, your own computer. Um, and another important distinction, while the security of personal information is extraordinarily important and there are a lot of dangers inherent in that information getting loose, the security of the physical person is exactly what we're dealing with when we're talking about physical security. It allows somebody into your house, into your room, to mingle with your family when they're not invited. Um, the stakes are simply higher. This is the only barrier of entry between them physically and you in many, many, many cases. Um, yes? Um, I just want to add a note to that. A, a lot of these new exploits, as far as like the, the safety of your family and whatnot, with these, with these specifically, residentially and as far as small business is concerned, there, there's admittedly little chance that, that the uh, criminals are going to use techniques like this because they do take practice and it's easier to kick down the door or put a rock through the window, whatever the case may be. Um, the people that really need to be worried about this are ones that have facilities that are, that are at high risk, have high value uh, information and things like that. But remember, as Schuyler says, in the end this is about people and property. As opposed to just as opposed to data. So, keeping that in mind, if you want to help, you can get a hold of me at Skyler at ndemag.com. Uh, and if there's anybody else in particular that you want to talk to that we talked about during the talk, I can put you directly in touch with them. Um, I have a couple of final thoughts after this, even though this slide is called Final Thoughts, uh, but people to thank and that sort of thing. Uh, right now, I would encourage any questions that you have for either of us. Yes, sir. The blank brass stock? Um, I get it from Ace Hardware. There is a uh, display that you can find at most of them called K&S Metals. They stock all kinds of different sizes of uh, brass, aluminum, and stainless steel tubing. Um, you can also find it at hobby shops. I find that Hobby Town USA tends, tends to carry that stock. Um, if you're interested, the wire being used is... Uh, 0 0.02 inch diameter, and that's also available as under the name Music Wire. And uh, if any of you are interested in recreating any of the tools that we talked about today, uh, the Abus tool or John's tool plans for them are available online. Uh, you'll particularly find them around LP 101. Um, uh, I don't know. I think you guys generally encourage people to go out and make the tools, yeah? Yeah, whenever I um, found this and found out that somebody else already, already did it, it kind of uh, it discouraged me, but at the same time, it, it, it was almost like like a like a liberating thing. I ended up giving the design to, to the uh, Locksport community. That happened back in, I think, December. That's how long this thing has been sitting, waiting to be publicly released. It's been sitting in the back corners of LP 101 for that many months. Um, Hope was when I first talked about it, and this is the second time. I, I encourage anyone to take. You know this simple little brass tool that can open these locks and improve it. You know I'm I'm not the most brilliant engineer out there. You know there there are people in this room that I'm sure can figure out a better way. You know why did he do it this way? I could do it this easier. And we're already seeing that on the forums. Um, there's a member there's a member named Raymundo that's been making these things uh, experimentally out of like big pens, I think. Yeah, he, he wants to he, he wants to do the same process we did with the Avis and simplify it to the simplest, cheapest version he can make. He was the one who gave us the suggestion for the nail head. Actually, he's he's a pretty cool guy. Um, 
specifically about my tool, if you guys have any questions about how to produce it, how it works, any of that, I'm probably going to be in the lockpicking village for the next uh, three days straight. <laughs> and uh, I'll try to be sober. <laughs> But uh, just feel free to approach me and ask anything. I, I love, I, even though I've been talking about this stupid tool for the last nine months, I still have to talk to people about it. <laughs> uh, anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah, the, uh, the trick with ARX is, let me see. Can they have you several security features. Yeah, where do you want to go to? Uh, go back to the, um, although it's not an ARX pin, I wish I had oh. the picture in there. The I know, that's, that's a beautiful picture I, I, that none I, I, of you get to see. I had a picture <laughs> of a pile of ARX pins. Is it in the fourth issue? Um, no, it's not. Okay. I, I had a picture of a pile of ARX pins, and it had a caption that said, why isn't this shit standard? You know, and, and, now, and, and now it is. Let's see. Okay. Again, this is not an ARX pin. This is an old school uh, medical original pin. But you can see that groove that that, side bar, that those sidebar teeth drop into. It doesn't go all the way through the pin. It stops on that tip. Because it stops, you can't get the wire in there. There's just not enough room. It's it's wedged up against the, against the, uh, the the side of the plug wall there. Now, we have Mike's article on ARX in issue four. You keep talking. I'm going to pull it up. Yeah, yeah. Pull, pull up the article. Um, ARX, there's a little uh, thing about ARX. It's not just the closed grooves. It's a, it's a whole system that was designed to make decoding and picking as difficult as possible. It was, it was really targeted for, for uh, government facilities as opposed to the average consumer, and that's why we haven't seen any, anything about it until now. I mean, the only reason we knew ARX existed was because we found one PDF file, one document from, like, 93 that said it was coming out. You know, that, that, that was all the information we had. It, it, they, they do all kinds of cool things like rings. Here we go. We've got some, uh, some images here. Th th these were drawn up by a member named is it Safety Off. Safety Off with a Safety zero. Safety Off did these, did these in 3D. <laughs> these are some examples of ARX pins. You can see it's not just the closed grooves. You've got some rings and whatnot. The ARX pins actually solve more than just this one attack. Um, they, they defeat a very interesting sonic attack as well, um, which is talked about in issue four in some detail. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy experimental, you know, government techniques about weighing the pin stacks and, you know, looking for density and whatnot. Um, wh one that I noticed on the, uh, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you noticed on the other one, I don't see one here. The true groove was closed off, yeah? But there was a false groove. It's, they're, they're meant to trick you whenever you're trying to rotate these pins. On the uh, on the one with the rings, there's a false groove right oh, there. Oh, is there? Yep. Okay. Um, what I found on some of these is that that false groove does go all, all the way through to the bottom of the pins. Now, the issue with that is that all you have to do is make the wire smaller. And you can hook into it. But instead of lining up the marks on the tool so that you're, so that you're aligning the bar... You do the opposite. You misalign them because you know the false gate is not right. And it, it takes a, a .005 inch diameter uh, guitar string <laughs> to get into that little groove. And I'm going to be honest, I haven't, I haven't made this work completely yet, but we have been able to hook, hook into and control rotation. So it's, it's not over. <laughs> <laughs> um, and an important note here at the bottom of the article, uh, the micro-milled pins, the ones with just that little piece taken out of the center so that it's just large enough for the sidebar, they can't be used in the master keyed bin stacks. And uh, that's, I mean, the fact is Medico is typically a uh, institutional sort of lock that you need master keyed. If those, mi they call them micro when it's close off at the top and bottom. If those pins could be used and somehow compatible with master key systems, it would solve a whole lot of stuff coming out right now. But the fact is, people still want to be able to put one key in and then put another key in and they both work. Um, I thought I might show a picture of the uh, RKS now that I got a couple pictures. Uh, so these were in the last issue of the magazine. I should have simply implied them to this. Uh, so this is the RKS that we talked about earlier. Uh, you can see each of the discs inside and the sidebar on the top. Uh, this is their manual dialer that they use for it. Um, really nice piece of, uh, really nice dialer. And these are each of the individual wheels. And this is what I'd like to point out. Um, you see the two brass wheels stacked on top of each other. The one in the back... Uh, okay, so I kind of want to jump up there and point at it. Um, there's a small screw that's right here. 
Hey, that's Andy. Small screw that's right here, and a small screw that's right here. Those are the flies that we were talking about earlier. Each of those can be removed from their position, installed in any other position along the rim of that uh, disc, and once you've done that, you've rekeyed the lock. So you're, you're given, it's an extraordinarily versatile uh, mechanical end to that lock. Um, so yeah, there we go. Basically the way that I describe it to people, it's like, a, how, many, how many discs is it? Is it seven or nine? Uh, it, it's six with this fat one back here, so seven. Six. So six or seven, um, it, it, it's like a, a safe with six or seven numbers in the combination that fits in your doorknob and you don't have to remember the numbers. <laughs> so it's, I mean, it's, it's really ingenious that, that, that they thought of this, and uh, I, I hope they go a long way and that we'll be able to break them, and then they'll fix them. <laughs> um, any other questions? Yes? Ah, as a... As a matter of fact, no. In particular, um, it, it's extraordinarily hard to get any sort of manipulate any sort of feeling via manipulation on the RKS. Uh, first of all, you would have to get your hands on a dialer, uh, which should be restricted to authorized use. Even if you are able to, uh, the dialer itself has a tactile click every single time you move it, uh, and feeling anything through that, uh, you know, the, that that wall of sound and feeling um, is extraordinarily difficult, uh, and, and that's. It's just kind of where it starts, and you know you could of course build your own dialer for it, whatever the case may be. Um, there are false gates carved into each one of the discs. Um, the false gates will muck up your ability to feel where the true gate is, of course, when you're manipulating it, um, or if you can physically manipulate it, will will hamper your ability to set it into the proper gate to release the lock. Um, yes. Also, in regard to uh, traditional safe cracking techniques, talking about by manipulation, yeah, like, like a, a group two safe lock, for example, that whole technique is based on measuring contact points on a uh, cam wheel. As you line up more gates, the nose the, the nose of the cam will drop further and further and further, and it will make the contact region smaller and smaller and smaller. In this, it's a, it's direct drive. There's no cam wheel in there. There's no, there's no nose on a, on a lever that drops in. It, 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 it's if you want to compare it to something, it's almost like a, uh, a bad, uh, bad comparison, a master lock, <laughs> in that you can't manipulate a master lock like you would a normal group two safe lock, which is not to say that they're secure, but when with the addition of, of, of false gates, it's, it, it's a different process. And if you, if you or any of you think, um, have an idea for how to manipulate these locks open, Please do, because <laughs> we, we want to know about it. Yes, and please contact us. Um, there, there's another very cool uh, safe attack um, that was first demonstrated to me at the Dutch Open. Uh, you take a palm sander, you put it up against the face of the, uh, of the wheel, you vibrate it for a while, and if the bar is sitting at the top, and if there's a big gate cut out of each of the wheels, like there is in a safe, eventually those wheels will sort of shift themselves and line up so that the lightest part is facing up, of course. So there will be a big gap, the bar will drop right in, you can open the safe up. Now, it, that works on some cheap safes, you know, that's, uh, that's a problem that's been solved in the wild. Um, and, but at the Dutch Open as well, somebody grabbed uh, John's lock, they grabbed a palm sander and they started going at it, and we saw movement. Now, it was movement. These are extraordinarily light discs. The, um, you know, the, the difference between weight on either side is very, very minimal. Um, but, and again, there are six or seven discs on each one. So the possibility of this working, the probability of this actually working in the field on a shipping container out on a boat is very, very unlikely. That said, his addition of the false gates stymies the attack from the get-go. It, it sets off the balance of the wheels and it gives it something else to catch into as it's being shaken around. And th th this is a good thing. Whenever we talk about, you know, I found an exploit for this lock, we don't think the question should be, oh, can you, can you open one in front of us? Like, it, it, it shouldn't be like a, a proof of demonstration sort of a thing. If you can prove that the theory is sound and the thing will work, there should be no reason to open ten of them, in, or in my case, three of them in front of a, a medical representative. Um, if you can demonstrate that what you have is sound, that should be enough for them to at least look into it and make design improvements if they can.
And, and, and I think that, that was the case with the uh, false gates here. Just because the palm sander didn't open the lock doesn't mean that it was meaningless. It was the beginning. And eventually, somebody might be able to leverage it. <clears throat> and as such, they addressed it, despite it being fairly improbable. That said, an embedded lock company and your approach to them, uh, you, you know, you should still cowboy up and uh, open the thing if you're going to approach a, an, a, you know, an embedded lock company, because uh, the costs there are significant for them to take you seriously. Anybody else? Sweet. All right, I just got a couple of final things to say, and we'll be uh, done ahead of schedule, because I am not good at timing my talks. That's all right. I'll let you get a beer. Boom. All right. I'd like to very specifically thank... Oh, hey. Abus is going to get thanked this whole time. Um, here we go. Uh, I want to thank Zeke79. He's the guy who provided the pictures for the quick set. He's the guy who ran the high security contest that led to some of the developments with Abus. Thank you. Uh, and he, uh, he's just an incredible member of the community who continues to do amazing work. Uh, he's been a little bit out of commission for a while, um, but he's coming back strong. Uh, Raymundo and Digital Blue, uh, these are the guys who helped me in particular simplify Yako's attack. Um, and in general, just fantastic people in the community. Go right ahead. Read up. Mike Groot in MBI, he is in the audience today. He's there the, he is. He's yeah. waving. <laughs> uh, um, he's the managing editor for NDE uh, and does incredible work getting that out the door he, each time we release. He also provided me with um, pinned, up, pinned up medicos. He has the ability to, to pin medical locks, which really helped in uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the testing in the process of my tool. And I'd, I'd like to thank him for that. Uh, lockpicology.com have been gracious in providing us room to discuss articles that are in the magazine. Um, some wonderful people over there. And LP101 is just the hub of all things lock sport. Um, and, and great work for us. Forget this John King guy. <laughs> uh, John King is fantastic. Peter Field, uh, that's not supposed to be plural. Um, I, he was great and wonderfully gracious to work with, and uh, I'm looking forward to many future conversations. Uh, Walt Strader over at Quickset, uh, I, when I saw that quote in the Wall Street Journal, I rushed around calling every single person I could at Black & Decker Home & Hardware. Uh, I left messages on so many random people's phones, just desperately trying to get a hold of him. He called me the next day and talked to me for two hours, um, talked to me all about the work that they were doing, um, and we're putting together a fantastic article on that, and uh, really excited to work with him. Uh, John Lachlan, of course, of the RKS, provided us a great deal of information for this presentation, uh, for the article. He's just a good friend. Uh, and his father, Bob, I should have mentioned here as well, Bob Lachlan also. You want to talk about Yako? Yako has been a staple in the, um, in the community, LP101. And also, if you guys haven't seen it, there is an LP101 IRC channel. It's on Slashnet. It's pound LP101. You know, there's a lot of separation of material on the website and the forums about what you can and can't talk about. And uh, I don't want to say that the, that the uh, channel disobeys that, but it's a lot looser. And, and it, you can generally meet some very, very um, creative people on there with, with new experimental stuff coming out. It's and, official and Yeko, with quotes. Yeah. And, and, and Yako was one of those. He's always, he's always in that channel. Whenever he finds new things with, a, with a Abloy or Avis, he's always on there posting them. So we... We, we kind of bounce ideas off each other. But the fact that you discovered this thing, you know, that you can take, you know, a piece of white glue and, and stamp the number off the back of a disc, and you can find what the code is, is just amazing to me. Um, as you said, the IRC channel is uh, shockingly the hub of a great deal of work that's going on in this community and some amazing high security advancements. Uh, and Abus, of course, just an absolute class act as a company and incredible to work with uh, as, they, uh, as they approached Yako and fixed that problem. For Locksport. For Locksport! <laughs> Thank you all very much.